as the Undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops and as a member of the Dicastery for Communication, Sister Natalie Beckhart is actually probably one of the most powerful women in the church today. Sister Natalie joins His Excellency today on Let Me Be Frank to tell her beautiful vocation story, uh, to talk about reaching out to young people, and to let us know where things are going with the Synod on Synodality. Great conversation coming up next on 1350 AM and 103.9 FM or on the Veritas mobile app on your phone. If you don't yet have the app, go right now and get it from the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or VeritasCatholic.com. Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from our wonderful sponsor, Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad, the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Hello and welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on Veritas Catholic Network. I am Steve Lee, and it is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, it's good to see you, my friend. And we have a great guest today. I'm really excited. So I have to admit that uh, I'm not as versed in Vatican, people in the Vatican, as maybe I should be. And it wasn't until this morning that I was able to really look into uh, our guest's bio. Um, but... Uh, uh, let me just jump in and introduce. I, I, I want to say that um, I'm, I'm kind of excited to have on somebody who is French, as I've been immersed in the Tour de France for the past couple of weeks. So <laughs> anyway, Sister Natalie Beckhart is the undersecretary at the Synod of Bishops General Secretariat and a member of the Dicastery for Communication. After studying economics and business and working as a consultant in marketing and advertising, Sister Natalie joined the Xavier Sisters in France, and for 25 years, she's been very involved with youth ministry and in various positions with uh, working with the French bishops and in the Vatican. And uh, Sister Natalie brings to us her expertise on synodality and youth, and to give us some more insight, uh, hopefully, on the synod on synodality, um, which that process is already underway throughout the world and here in Bridgeport. Um, so, uh, Sister Natalie Beckhart, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you so much also, Bishop Caggiano. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I greet all of you uh, from uh, Rome. I am here uh, five minutes from uh, St. Peter on Via della Conciliazione. <laughs> oh, my gosh. How many times did I walk that road when I lived in Rome? Oh, my God. <laughs> Sister, I'm delighted, first of all, that you are here and we've, we reconnect because as we were chatting before we started our taping, we first met at the Synod of Youth, right? And I think we were in the same group, were we not in the same conversational group? Yeah, yes, exactly. We were in this uh, circular minora, this small language group, because yeah. I have chosen to be in an English-speaking group, and it was really a, a pleasure to be with you and all the participants. I have wonderful memory from this. I do, too. And I, and I remember how diverse the group was, right? Because we had English-speaking bishops from India, from Africa, from, from of course, the, the States, from Canada, uh, from Australia. Yes, and Asia also. Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was very international and also with some great young people who were there. As oh, well. yes. There was one man in particular from Pakistan mm -hmm. who really yeah. was very impressive. In fact, he contacted me. He's discerning a vocation now to priesthood. Yeah, yes, I know that. Yeah, it's, it's tremendous. So, um, so I always ask our guests um, the following question because we've all had our own journeys of life. And yours, of course, brought you into consecrated life. So our, our listeners take great consolation in hearing those different stories. So would you mind, to the extent that you're comfortable, 
how did you become a religious sister? What led you, because you had a very interesting past, to religious life and then ultimately where you are now, because you are quite a historic figure in the Vatican. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was such a surprise. But maybe what I can say is I was brought up in a Catholic family, the eldest of five. Uh, I went to Catholic school. I was involved in my parish. Uh, I have received a lot through Catholic uh, scouting because in France, it's very lively. But it was really during my um, studies when I was in a business school with a chaplaincy, what you call campus ministry. Um, I began to think more about, well, what is the meaning of life? Okay, I have come here, I have studied, but now what do I want to do with my life and what is the meaning of life? And after my uh, studies, I decided before beginning to work um, to give one year as volunteer. I wanted to have the, this experience and to serve somewhere. And I have discerned to go to Lebanon. So during one year in Beirut, after my uh, studies, and it was just after the civil war in Beirut, I went there to teach in a Catholic school with some sisters. And during my last year of studies, I met uh, a deep experience of personal encounter with Christ, uh, praying with the Bible, discovering more. And I started a spiritual direction. And it was truly in Lebanon meeting with uh, young consecrated in this country. You know, they have been through very difficult um, years of war, but they had such a joy and uh, they were able to really testimony uh, the, the blessing of a life dedicated to Christ and to the other. So it was in Lebanon that I began to think more about a possible call for a consecrated life. And uh, also being far from my country, I discovered that I was uh, gifted to have, grew, to have spent my life in a peaceful country, uh, having a good education. And so I realized that I have received a lot. And I discovered also in prayer that there is no sense to receive if you don't give. <laughs> and what I have received, I have to give it to the others. And so that was through this uh, personal also journey and, and prayer and discernment that I began to uh, think more about religious life as a way to follow Christ and really to serve the others. And uh, so I, I'm very grateful for my experience in Lebanon and what I have received there. And then I came back to France. I started to work two years, um, but to continue my discernment and uh, then it was rather clear that uh, I thought uh, Christ was calling me uh, to follow him in religious life with the Xavier sister, an Ignatian order. Oh, it's an Ignatian order. I didn't realize that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah yes. Sometimes I say it's one among all uh, different uh, female versions of the Jesuit. <laughs> oh, there you go. They are oh, very wow. important in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that actually is a great segue for one of the one of the areas, of course, when we met, one of your specialities that you spent a great deal of time is with youth and mm -hmm. young adults and the evangelization of young adults, which I think is a critical need in the church. Right, even coming out of the synod, I think it's every, at least in my diocese in the United States, it is a critical need. And COVID has made it worse, and it's made it even yeah. a greater need. So, talk to us about your experiences in that whole important world of ministry. Yeah, yes, uh, I already agree with you. And uh, you know, thinking about what has happened uh, with this COVID time, all the statistics show that the first victims of um, you know, mental health issue because of COVID, isolation, uh, unemployment, difficulties are the young people. And among the young, usually also the, the women. Um, so it was, especially in Lebanon, you know, I, I, uh, I was teaching in a Catholic school with young people who have grown up through the war, experimenting very difficult uh, years. 
Um, and I also, I was involved with them also with, um, during the weekend, I went to a house uh, for uh, young people who had no family and, you know, just to be there. And so it really, it really, it was in Lebanon that I started the accompaniment with young people. And then I was called to do that in France. And I discovered, and I think that was also our experience at the Synod on News, that the, really the first things young people want or need <laughs> is to be listened to, to have, uh, you know, elder people, adults uh, who just walk with them, journey with them on the road, listen to them. And also they need guidance and they need, you know, the really is the most important question of so many young people is the one I had when I was young, I think maybe you also, uh, what is the meaning of life? And in this world of two days, so difficult with so many crises and many young people have a lot of questions and existential questions and they, they want to be useful. They want to, uh, to serve many of them. They are generous, but uh, they, they really need uh, people who are older who can walk with them and tell them, you know, even if there are many difficulties, uh, storms in your life, there is light. There is possible light at the end and, and they need hope, I think the core of our uh, ministry with young people, it's to testimony that life is stronger than death, that light uh, is uh, stronger than darkness, and to, to share with them the joy of the gospel, uh, to be for them uh, brothers and sisters who uh, reflect the life of Christ to help them uh, to, to discover the path of life and a path to be, uh, that is a path of happiness, but not an easy uh, pink happiness. Mm -hmm. But uh, the meaning of life is to serve the others. Without a doubt. Well, no, no, without a doubt. You know what I find interesting here, and it's very disturbing actually, the number of suicides among young people is rising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Truly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I, I just read some statistics about in Europe, you know, they were saying incredibly uh, a great increase, but it's also in the United States. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And see, the debate that we have here in the United States among very good people, right, who, who I think mean well in, 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 in many respects, there's a question of accompaniment. Mm. There is a group of people who are faithful, who understand that accompaniment is walking with someone, right? And creating a relationship that allows a conversation so that you could raise issues that they need to hear, but you can't do it until you have a relationship with them. Mm. But then there's another group that says, well, that's important, but, but um, are you leading them somewhere? Like, in other words, are you just walking for the sake of walking? Are you walking for, so that they can understand the truth more deeply and be challenged to live it? So it, there's always the tendency to do the, pull it apart and say, it's, you have to do this or you have to do that. Mm -hmm. and, I always, and I always say to them, you have to do both. Mm -hmm. would, would you agree with that? Or how would you express it? Yes, you know, listening to you, uh... I was thinking, maybe you remember that during the Synod on News, what came as a kind of output uh, and as a kind of paradigmatic image for the accompaniment of young people and the evangelization of young people is the image of the road of Emmaus. Yes. And I think as youth ministers, <laughs> uh, our call is to be uh, with young people like Jesus with the disciples of Emmaus. Right. You know, Jesus go where they are, he reach them on the road, even if it's the wrong road, he begin to listen to them, their disillusions, their sufferings, mm -hmm. he helps them to reread their experience, to give, uh, to put some um, right. words about what they have. And then uh, after listening to them, he explains them the scriptures. But Jesus doesn't impose himself, but at a time, because he has enlightened something in them, you know, the disciples 
calls us Jesus remain with us. And uh, so Jesus was able through this, you know, spiritual conversation, this deep listening, like it's the way God is listening to us to reach something profound in them. Because our deep conviction also is that, you know, the Holy Spirit is working uh, in every life. <laughs> well, people of goodwill, but eyes. Um, and uh, so I think what we have to do is not to lead young people as, you know, just a leader who want to impose his road or her road, but to lead them to, lead them to be led by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that right. is the, the true uh, guide, we, we, we can say. Right. But you can't discern the Holy Spirit alone. That's why accompaniment, um, right. mentoring is very, very important. And uh, at the end, what is very interesting with what is happening on this road of Emmaus, so Jesus remain with the disciples, they eat together, you know, it's a figure of the Eucharist. And then the disciples are converted, they go back to Jerusalem and they are reintegrated to the community. So I think that's truly the path with young people because you are expressing how so many feel loneless or isolated or separated from the other on their road. But the, the true, we can't grow up, we can't become who we are called to become without the others. We are first part of a community. Uh, and I think that's something very important uh, that young people are looking for. You know, they, they want to be with friends, with, um, that's why the fruit of the Synod on Youth was wonderful and, and the, also the image for Francis has chosen at the center of uh, his post uh, synodal exhortation, Christus Vivi, to express um, how young people are called uh, to encounter Jesus is as a friend, because many young people have this experience of friendship. So I think we need to accompany them, you know, like good friends not just listening to them, but also telling them when uh, they right. are going in a, right. Right. a new way. Right. Uh, uh, but as you say, you can't just impose that from outside. It's through relationships. Right. And I remember well uh, that uh, in the final document of the Synod on Young People, it was written because that was our experience, that from the beginning, faith is transmitted through relationships with relationships mm -hmm. and that is this through this style of accompaniment uh, that mm -hmm. we can help young people really to to meet personally jesus right. that's for me the the scope of all uh, youth uh, yeah. mm -hmm. history to create to propose to accompany young people so that they can have a deep encounter with christ mm -hmm. You know what it is, sister, the way I kind of explain it, because everything you said, I absolutely be believe and agree with, because I think it's exactly the methodology. I, I often tell people, if, if you doubt whether or not it's important to listen to the concerns of the person next to you, I said, do not ever forget that if a person believes that you are truly listening to them, they also believe that you value them, that you, they are worth your time. And that's ultimately what is the real difficulty, that many young people do not believe, they doubt their own self-worth, their own dignity. And when a person dismisses them, you are reinforcing that opinion, that, that sense that I'm not worth your time. I'm not worth you spending some time with me so what's wrong with me? But So then when we say God loves you, it's almost unbelievable if they don't have any experience of people mm -hmm. who are going to invest in them, right? Yeah, so, yes, that's right? true. There's mm -hmm. one other thing too that I always tell people when I, when I do, you know, when I address youth ministry, I said, I will love you. I will not always love what you do, mm -hmm. but I will always love you. 
Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, we live in a time where what I do, if you, if you in, my, in the relationship I form, I t- see it in my family, in the relationships we form with one another, a relationships that really over time show that I really do care for you, that I love you. Even in those relationships, it's hard at times to say, now, what you are doing here is doing you harm, is doing your neighbor harm. You have to look at this. Mm. That's difficult because we live in a world where it says, if you criticize what I do, you criticize me. If you say you don't appreciate what I'm doing, then you don't appreciate me. And, and young people, unfortunately, live in a world where they're being told that all the time. Mm. And Christ says something different. No matter, in the end, I will love you always. Always. Yeah, yeah, always. yes, that's true. And I, I am very touched by what you, you say and share because it's true, we have to find ways to value uh, uh, who the young people are and uh, to recognize uh, right. them. And I think the first gift we can give them that is not easy in our society is time, you know, and, and um, space, right. time and space uh, just right. to encounter them. Absolutely. Uh, and they, they need uh, also free space. Uh, and if you, you spend time with them, you already express that you care for them. Amen, exactly. And what I find fascinating is, and you're much closer to the scene than I am, but Pope Francis now in his reflections on the elderly is raising many ways the same issue because the elderly in many countries, including the United States, feel dismissed. They feel as if they've been written off. That society mm. values only the young, only the exciting, only the new, and that they mm. and that the elderly, in many ways, particularly here in our country, is almost like I wouldn't say a necessary burden, but it, they they have nothing to offer. But the Pope is saying, yes, they do, mm. and we have yes. to value them too, right? <laughs> Yeah, yes. And maybe you remember, uh, it's very interesting because each time Pope Francis is speaking to the young people or speaking about the young people, he's always speaking also about uh, elder people. And uh, at the opening of the of the synod and also at the end, you know, uh, he was really emphasizing this idea that uh, young people have uh, dreams, and all the people have visions, uh, quoting the, this passage of the prophet Joel. And maybe you remember at the end, at the time, one young observer from the Samoa Islands used the image of the church as a canoe. Yes, because yes, it's yes, a structure yes. uh, on the canoe, you have the young people who have energy and they can row. <laughs> And the older people who have wisdom, who who know the direction, can uh, help to find the right direction. And the canoe works well when you have both young people and elder people. And Pope Francis took this image also uh, in in Christus Vivit to express that a synodal church, a church has to be like this canoe. Uh, with young and older people together. Uh, and for me, that's a beautiful image of the synodal church that is a relational church, an inclusive church with all ages, all state of life, in which each one has a place. Right. Uh, the charisms right. are recognized and valued, and everyone has a voice. And uh, that's how we can uh, really carry the mission of the church all together. We need both the young people and the elder, the men and the women, (laughs) Uh, the diversity uh, of the people of God. Absolutely. You know, I remember that. It was a young man. If I remember, it's the same. It was big. Yeah, but he was a big man. God bless him. Oh, yeah. I do remember that. Sitting in the back of the room when he made the observation. Remember (laughs) what? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I must tell you, that was one of the high points of my ministry, being able to participate in the Synod. Uh, For no other reason, you know, I studied in Rome, 
So I lived five years in Rome. You appreciate the universality of the church in Rome in so many ways. You see it every day now, right? It, it, yeah. It's the church in all shapes, sizes, yeah. right? Yeah. But in that synod, when we gathered together, it really was an extraordinary moment of who the church um, is, at least in the different languages and cultures and continents. I mean, we really are a global church. Yes, that's true. And you know, when I think back about my experience at the Synod on Young People, and <laughs> I talk about it, really, for me, it was the church we dream. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a joyful church, even uh, if I remember uh, when you speak about young people from all over the world, <laughs> it's so about so many problems. But maybe you remember at the end, at the closing mass, there was such a joy, a missionary yes. impetus. We have ex expressed that we have experienced something of a new Pentecost, and we couldn't keep this joy of synodality for us. I remember at, after yes. the closing of the synod, we had only the desire to share that with others. Yes. And I often refer to that because what we have experienced with young people during the synod was truly a church of brothers and sisters in Christ, listening to each other, bishops, cardinals, sisters, young people, men and women, uh, all this diversity with, as you, you know, from all over the world. But we have experienced such a communion. We have experienced really for me, I couldn't imagine before that it will be such a deep, spiritual, human, ecclesial experience that really has transformed me. And so now I have only the desire, you know, that other people could, could experience that. Absolutely. Uh, not only a few, we were very happy to be yes. at the synod. Yes, but we and were a few. Synod on synodality now is really to propose to all the mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. all the people of God to have this kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when really you journey together, pray together, uh, listen to each other, you try to discern the Holy Spirit, you receive a renewal and such fruits that are fruits of the Spirit, joy, mm -hmm. peace. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a great segue, sister, because we're going to take a break. I think Steve's giving me the signal. We have to take a break. And then when we come back, your role in the Synod. Um, on synodality and in the synodal's office and what we, what Holy Father is hoping will happen in this process and where it will lead us in the future. We could talk about that in the second half. Yes. Okay, well, see you soon. Wonderful. So this is Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. His Excellency is having a wonderful conversation with Sister Natalie Beckhardt, a sister with the Ignatian Order, the Xavier Sisters in France, and we will be right back after the break. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. 
Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network with Bishop Frank Caggiano. His Excellency has been speaking with Sister Natalie Beckhart. And uh, you were talking in the first segment about uh, the Synod on Youth. And there are other synods happening. So, Excellency, I'll turn it yes, over. Yes, no, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 one of the insights, Sister, that you made, which I think is very, very important, is when we had the experience of going to the Synod on Youth, we were the few. We were, I mean, we were about maybe 250, I forget how many we were. But, and, and it was a profound experience for us. But we're 250 out of 1.3 billion. <laughs> so now, so now, on the synod on synodality, I think it's fair to say, and I want to hear your thoughts, the Holy Father is opening up the process to everyone in the whole church. Yeah, yes. And you know, the first sentence of the preparatory document that is the roadmap for, for the synod that has been opened so last October is the old church is convoked in synod. And that's the first time in all the history of the church that all the baptized, all the church is convoked in a synod. And really we can say that with Pope Francis now, you know, synodality is not for a few bishops uh, every two or three years, <laughs> but it's a call for um, all the church every time, every everywhere. And in a way, the goal of the synod, what Pope Francis wants is a kind of synodalization of all the church. Because at this stage, the church has discerned, and it was really one of the big fruits of the Synod on Young People, but then the Synod on the Amazon has also deepened this call. And we can say we at this stage of the reception of the Second Vatican Council, the church has discerned and understood that synodality is the call of God for uh, the church in the third millennium. So it's really to, to embrace, I would say, synodality and, and this path of synodality is to answer the call of God. Uh, to be the church, the same church from the beginning, <laughs> and synodality is the constitutive dimension of the church, but in this historic time. So synodality is truly, um, you know, a dynamic vision of the church in history. And we have really understood that the only way to transmit the faith today is to be a synodal church. Mm -hmm. And so with Pope Francis, it, because uh, from the beginning of his pontificate, really he emphasized the need to uh, missionary transformation of the church and to continue to proclaim the gospel, to evangelize the people as you really uh, highlight, uh, we need, we can't do it just a few people alone. It's everybody has to be a missionary uh, disciple right, right. and we need to carry on the mission of the church all together as people of God. Mm -hmm. And you that's know, really what Pope Francis is trying to awake. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So that as he often say, you know, everybody in the church has to be protagonist. No, no one is a mere extra. Uh, we are all called to be uh, these uh, missionary pilgrims on the road, um, not just to be the church uh, at intra, you know, uh, as a communion, of course, but for the service uh, of evangelization. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I found, Sister, here in Bridgeport? Um, many people could not, could not define what a synod actually was. Mm. They had many people had never even heard of the word, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so so you, you're very much an expert in this. So for the, like the average person in church, how would you explain what a synod is? Like, what what is it? What would you say? Well, we can say now that, um, you know, uh, well, the, etymology of synod and synodality is journeying together. And it's a, it's a gathering. <laughs> uh, it's an assembly uh, to, to discern uh, what uh, God is asking to is asking the church. And um, the first synod, 
and every all the Batais may remember that the first synod in a way or council because that was the same word in Greek and in Latin is uh, in uh, the act of the apostle chapter 15 the council of Jerusalem mm -hmm. there is a, an issue a debate among a conflict among the community do the people who were not Jews before uh, choosing to follow Christ do they have to be circumcised or not and they don't agree so what do they do? <laughs> they gather together, uh, the first community, they pray, they talk together, they discern, and at the end, they find a consensus to decide that those who are not Jews won't need to be circumcised. So it's a way from the beginning of the church to decide together, you know, and the style of the early church was the style of the community uh, in which nobody decided alone. And when there were conflict difficulties, people and bishops were gathering <laughs> together to talk, to pray, to discern, and to find a consensus. <laughs> Nowadays, we rediscover this dimension of synodality as a fruit of the Council, uh, Second Vatican Council, uh, really to express that uh, the, the church is a people of God all together, all the baptized, and uh, it's very rooted in this notion of what we could say, sensus fidei fidelium, that means uh, that there is a sense of faith of all the people of God together. The Holy Spirit, God is giving something uh, of a kind of truth, not only to the hierarchy, but also to the people of God altogether. And so we have to listen uh, to, to them because the Holy Spirit is working in uh, everybody. That doesn't change the important role of the pastors, of the bishops, of the Pope, but they are linked uh, with the, the people of God. And so this new kind of synod, we can say now, is really uh, to involve everybody in this discernment. At the end, the bishops and the Pope will the, you know, take the decision, but not alone, after consulting and listening to all the voices. Um, and that's what we are doing. But the difficulty of synodality is that we can talk about it, but it's not enough. Uh, we, we learn it by doing <laughs> through an experience. That's why, you know, until we had uh, the experience of the Synod of Bishop, or some also have uh, experiences of diocesan synods in many parts of the world, it's very difficult to understand what is it, because it's a living experience to be the church together and to discern together, listening to the Holy Spirit. It's about an experience of the Spirit, in fact. Absolutely. You know, what's interesting, we had a diocesan synod. Uh, now it's approaching nine years ago. Um, I called for it, I guess, when I first came. And then it was the year. So we really had it seven years ago. And it was amazing, sister, when we gathered. So we had 300 delegates from the diocese that were chosen. Um, the vast majority were laity. There were 25 priests and there were about 15 religious. Anyway, my point is, to your point, when we gathered, it was amazing to see what, what we realized by just listening to one another that we did not realize when we started. And there was, right. a, very, there was a very painful moment in one of the, of the sessions when we talked about the prejudices that people came in with even at times almost a racist tendency. Um, and it became clear um, in the conversations that that was an issue that we yeah. have to address and we've been trying to address it since, which if we had not come together would never have come to the surface mm -hmm. as a need. And mm -hmm. it was, I believe it was the spirit pointing out that this is work to be done here in this diocese, right? So to your point, we've had it on a very small scale years ago, but now on the global. Mm. So how do you, 
like from your vantage point, you're in Rome. I mean, you're in the office. How do you synthesize all these opinions, like all this input? <laughs> Well, you know, it's about the process. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, it's an adventure. Well, we will receive uh, all the synthesis from the bishops' conferences and other uh, possible uh, mid August. So we have already received some, but uh, it's still in in process. But we have been working a lot about how uh, to prepare the methodology and the process, then to (laughs) read all the synthesis and to. And in fact, we will do here in Rome what we have uh, advice uh, for the way to do the diocesan synthesis and the national synthesis. So the first thing, you know, we will receive many contributions and you you had also this experience in the diocese. And the idea, it's not an academic uh, synthesis, you know, just uh, trying. No, it's an act of discernment. So it has to be a process uh, through also prayer, listening. And so we have imagined a, a group of many diverse people because we will receive the synthesis from everywhere in different languages. And it's very important that it is nobody alone that uh, reads that alone, well, it's almost impossible. But to cross read, you know, uh, with different lenses and to discern together through a process what the Holy Spirit is telling us through all these contributions and to try to um, <clears throat> understand the common trend, maybe. <laughs> but also the Holy Spirit can also speak through minority voices. But at the moment, we can feel yes, that's really a, a, a call. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. So, yes, we... We, we have we have almost finished to prepare all the process that will start after mid August uh, to do all this uh, process of uh, reading, uh, praying, discerning, and then drafting a document uh, that will be the basis for the next stage that will be uh, the continental meeting uh, between January and uh, March 23. So that to continue, you know, this process of uh, listening, because truly through all of that, you know, there is one unique question for the consultation that is uh, very easy. It's how are we already journeying together? And what is the next step the Holy Spirit is asking us? Then in the preparatory document, uh, as you probably have, you, you know, we have given 10 topics, like can 10 lenses to look more practically on dimensions of synodality. Uh, but we, we are very curious also to continue to read uh, uh, all the synthesis <laughs> that will come. I know that the United States is working hard now doing regional synthesis before the national one. Uh, mm-hmm. But I am very grateful to see how oh, so many, so many, almost all the U.S. Uh, dioceses uh, have uh, given their contribution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's um, what I said. I there's a deacon who is our coordinator on the diocese, and he's done a wonderful job. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing is, I had said to the delegates, I met with them when we first started, and they did their consultations in many different ways. Um, all the data that we now have, all the input that that's going to be synthesized, so it's hundreds and hundreds of papers yeah. synthesized into the DASM report. I said, we need to go back to all of that yeah. as a dice, because that is val- that is extremely valuable, that we now, while the process continues to go further and further on the global yeah. level, we need not to lose the opportunity to go back to that and sit with that material Mm. and do an ongoing discernment of what's being said here because there's a time constraint i mean this we have to get these things done mm. you know that i mean to be able to be ready we, it can't take 10 years we this yeah. so uh, I, I, what do you think of that i think there is tremendous value in continuing the process in the input we already have just as our diocesan family and continue yeah. to Right? Yes, of course. I'm very happy to hear you uh, to hear that, you know, and, and that's what, because 
we can say in a way, one thing is the document to uh, send uh, to the regions and the bishops' conference. But I, uh, during all the preparation before the synod, uh, when we were doing, you know, Zoom meeting with all bishops' conferences, explaining the process, we said, you know, the first fruits of the of the synod uh, have to be for the local churches, for the dioceses. Right. And what now I am um, listening as many feedback is many dioceses like you who says, okay. We have written our 10 pages synthesis, but all this listening, all this contribution, it's such a rich uh, experience and it will help us to continue this ongoing discernment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through this first phase of the synod, it was ready to provide an experience, a beginning of an experience of synodality or to continue it, but, uh, the synodal conversion of the church is not finished. Oh, no, uh, my gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it will take two years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... I it, really encourage, and I'm very, and it's very, you know, every day, every day I praise the Lord for what I contemplate of the work of the Holy Spirit everywhere, listening to all these fruits and the desire of so many bishops and people uh, like you who want to continue uh, this style, because it, in fact, what we are called to do is to have a new style in, in the church, uh, to live synodality as the life and the mission of the church, to be a listening church, right. a discerning church. Right. And uh, it's a long way. Right. But, you know, <laughs> let's connect it, uh, two dots then. So if, if when we sp spoke about youth and young adults, it, to listen to someone is an affirmation of their worth. It's an affirmation that we appreciate them, that, we, that we're saying in so many different ways that we care for you, we love you, and we need you, and that's why you're worth my time. If the church became truly a listening church, that would be the experience of every person in the church. Yeah. Yes, it's true. And in a way, you know, uh, young people are driving force of synodality. Mm -hmm. uh, but what also I discover now through the, the feedback we receive is that what young people want and have expressed during the synod on youth, they want to be listened to, they want to be protagonists, they want a synodal church. It's not only young people. <laughs> it's everybody. It's everybody. And so I often say now, you know, Pope Francis has stated very strongly in Christus Vivid chapter seven on youth ministry. Youth ministry has to be missionary, popular and synodal. But now what we discover is that, is that not only young pastor, uh, youth ministry or youth pastoral has to be synodal, but all kinds of pastoral. Right. <laughs> so this mm -hmm. synod is helping us to integrate uh, not only in a theoretical way, but through an experience that, yes, we really need to become more synodal as church. Absolutely. You know what's interesting, Sister, and I, I don't know if, if it's going to rise to the point where it gets to the, to, the, to the global document, but some of the most interesting <laughs> feedback we have are from non-practicing Catholics, non-Catholic mm. Christians, and non-believers, mm, which were engaged. Yeah. The, the diocesan pastoral council, group of lay people, of course, and, and others, that was their particular charge, to do one-on-one -on -one conversations mm. with people who are Christian and not Catholic and non-believers. And some of the feedback in it is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary, because it's holding a mirror up to the church. And many of these people, like for example, there was one Lutheran minister, tremendous regard for the church, tremendous. Mm. And, and our presence in the ministry and, and soared from a, 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 a way that I had never heard before because mm. it's, it's, it's literally outside the church, but the mm. church is connected to the world too. I mean, we're not just, even we're very big, but we're only a fraction of humanity and and we're called to the larger world, too. So I thought I had never conceived of that when we did our diocesan synod, to be honest. But that, I thought, was quite an extraordinary um, addition to the process. Mm -hmm. 
I must confess. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's it's wonderful because it's it's true, as you say, that synodality goes with a with a way you, you have two perspectives. One, it's a way to be uh, the church as a community of people of God, all together, priests, uh, lay people, religious, uh, bishops, all the diversity. But it goes as people of God, but it goes with a way to be in the world, in dialogue with the others, uh, in dialogue with all the people of the earth, we can say. So what you have done is really uh, highlighting that. And it's true that in, in a way, traditionally or, or usually, you know, for synod, you consult uh, the Baptist. But we also know from uh, the Second Vatican Council, and I refer to Nostra Itate, uh, the, uh, about uh, relationships with other religions, it is recognized that there, there are seeds of the verb or presence of the Holy Spirit in people of other faiths or people, men and women of goodwill. So if they want to contribute to say something to the church in a positive way, we can also listen to something interesting exactly. from them. And that was right. your experience that's uh, wonderful. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it sees it from a different perspective, which informs us um, in ways that we would never hear otherwise, right? Yes. You know, now, sister, I have to congratulate you because of your appointment to the Synod, to the Office of Synod, because it is historic. I had said it before, but I think many of our listeners may not know what your role is in the office now, the Synod. So would you explain to everyone what is it that you do now? <laughs> well, I will try, yes. So I have been appointed what is called here under secretary for the Secretariat of the Synod. So I am working with Cardinal Grech, who is the general secretary. So we can say the number one of this team. The synod, uh, the secretary of the synod here is a team of 14 people. And we are two under secretaries. So we are working as a team and with uh, the general secretary and we refer directly to Pope Francis. Um, and so our role as, as general secretariat, you know, is really to to animate the synod in the different steps and to promote synodality. And I can share with you, because maybe you, you don't know it yet, but with the new constitution on the Roman Curia that has been promulgated by Pope Francis and implemented in uh, last June uh, 5th, uh, it is written that uh, all the dicasteries in Rome have to collaborate with the general secretariat of the synod and no longer of the synod of bishops. That doesn't mean that there is no longer synod of bishops, but synod of bishops are one way of doing synodality. And so our role and a good, uh, most of my time is also through webinars, conference, uh, meetings, uh, publications, is to promote, explain synodality and to help to serve the local churches so, they, mm -hmm. so that they so, can engage, uh, be committed to this city. So sister, you travel a lot? You travel? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> do you like to travel? I hope yes, you do. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I like it. I like it because I already think, you know, here, okay, we are in Rome, but we are at the service of the local church. That's right. where the most important things Right. Are happening. <laughs> but, but you are going to have an historic role to play in the Synod of 2023 because you will be the first non-bishop, first consecrated sister, first woman to have a vote in the Synod. Is that not true? Yes, because the fact the, to be uh, this function under secretary uh, that before right. was always bishop, um, you are member of the, the Assembly of Bishops. And yes. as member, you vote like the bishop. Right. Yes, and, that's, that's and that is a, a, that is a very important step forward, I think, for the yeah, church, yeah. right? But uh, yes, I think it's, it's a sign, a really a prophetic sign of Pope Francis willing, you know, to, to express the need to listen to everybody. Right, right, right. Well, I think our time is up because Steve yeah. is looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> we do we do need to go to our uh, our next break but um I'm, the conversation is fascinating but you're listening to let me be frank on the veritas catholic network sister natalie beckhart one of the key players uh in the world really with the synods in rome and the re synodalization of the church uh, has been here with uh his excellency and we'll be right back after the break with a listener questioner for bishop frank Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Excellency, all right. Uh, An easy question. question. Easy. Don't give me a hard <laughs> question. I just, I just read you what the listeners email in. So. <laughs> uh, um, here, here's this week's. It says, mm -hmm. Excellency, how do I answer someone who objects to all the violence in the mm -hmm. Old Testament? Mm -hmm. And how about to someone who says it seems like the God of the Old Testament is different from God from the God of the New Testament? Well, my friend, it's a very important question, and it, it brings us into, um, into a theological discussion, which we one day could actually address in a podcast. But to give you a, a, a simple answer, <clears throat> God transcends all our concepts, transcends all our abilities to describe in any particular. That's, that, is so, that is why the incarnation, the human face of God, is such a revelation, such an enormous singular revelation. But having said that, in the Old Testament, in, in the inspired writers, they use the cultural norms of their day to express God's power, God's might, God's love of his people, God's providence, right? Which are different for us now. So if someone objects to the violence, so do I, because we have far better ways now to explain the same characteristics of God as they struggle to in their own time and place. But God is not a violent God. God is not a God who seeks revenge or murder or, or not, not at all. But we have to understand it in the context. And, and things have, have evolved, if I could use that word, right? But for us, the centerpiece, the litmus test, the lens through which we interpret all things now is Jesus Christ, who is the human person face of God, right? It's the human face of God in the world, the divine person with the human nature. So in that sense, I, I read it and I say to myself, mm, it, thank God we have evolved. Yeah. All right. Okay. So if you have a question for Bishop Frank, send it into us on social media, or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. And as we always do, we would like to thank Foundations in Faith. Mm -hmm. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport. And you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. And Sister Natalie Beckhart, thank you so much for joining us today from Rome and, and your important work and you will of course be in our prayers. Yes, without a doubt, sister, thank you for your tremendous work and, and, and for, for living your mission. There are many people who do it simply because they have to do it or they've been asked to do it, but you actually believe it, you live it. And that's tremendously important. And I'm very grateful to you. And I, I will continue to pray for you and please pray for me too. Since those days we first met, keep praying. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Frank. And I, I really pray for you, your diocese, and the church in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Hope thank you. Our paths could cross again. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All well, God's will, I guess. Where uh, life is filled with wrong, surprises. You're welcome at the city. <laughs> all right, oh, Excellency. Before we go, would you please yes. give us your blessing? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks, O Lord for allowing us in this time and in this place to be your missionary disciples and to reach out to our sisters and brothers in faith and all people of goodwill so that we might build a church that listens effectively and invites profoundly and deeply those around us to encounter the presence of Christ, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, and to send them out as glad messengers of hope. Bless Sister Natalie and her work and all her colleagues 
as the church continues this synodal path in earnest, may it bear great, great fruit. And may these summer days be a time of rest and peace. And we ask this as we ask all things in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I will see you then. God bless you. Steve, Amen. I'll see you next week. Bye.